actually came uh, quite literally from the color of the Yamuna as it is now, but also from something that I saw in 2019 and, and afterwards. You know, the sea of migrants who were flowing in and out of the city and uh, who somehow, despite the numbers and the odds against them, made the city their home. And it's a strange thing. With Calcutta, you have a relationship with the Hooghly. You know, to some extent, it's maybe not, a, it's a one-sided relationship because people seem to love the river out here, take beautiful photographs of it, but uh, maybe not care so much about the health of the river. And uh, the journey with Black River started when one day I saw something out of the corner of my eye, this river that I'd known was part of the history of Delhi, the Yamuna, you know, kind of there but not there. And I saw a silver gleam and something going on, a couple of boats. And I had time on my hands. And so I got out of the car, asked the driver to carry on back home, and I started to walk the river. And in very short order, I met a whole bunch of people whom I didn't expect. You know, I didn't quite make friends on that first trip. But there were women who guided me and said, uh, this part of it is absolutely fine. Don't go down that stretch because that's where the drunks hang out at night. And uh, that's also where they stash the bodies. I said, what bodies? So they said, huh, you know, because uh, we are on just near to state borders, so there's a constant dispute about whose jurisdiction this is in. And uh, to avoid police on either side, people just dump the bodies here and let it float across from this side to that side. And uh, then I met a very nice gangster who didn't introduce himself as a gangster. He was trying to get me to drink cups of tea. And uh, he'd made this tandoori chai thing. And then little by little, it came out that this was only his side profession. He had two side professions. He was a part-time pujari. And he was uh, a retired gangster, as he confessed rather shyly. And then he introduced me to his uh, family, who were all still, as he put it, in the business. And so the family shows up, and this was mostly the boy's side, unfortunately. But later, of course, I discovered somebody whom I want to put into a separate novel. And they all shuffled in, and they said, uh, so I'm the one who does the carjackings, and my name is Bunty. And I said, very nice to meet you, Bunty. And uh, I'm the one who specializes in the ATM robberies. And these are not where you go and rob cash from an ATM, because this was very close to the Haryana side of the border. What you do efficiently is you steal the ATM machine itself. There is, uh, you organize a tractor, and you organize a forklift, and uh, there you are. You take the ATM machine away and, uh, you know, uh, treat yourself to its contents later. And his name was also Bunty. And then there was a pickpocket. Uh, he ran a gang of pickpockets, and his name was Bunty, whereupon I stopped and I said, wait, wait a second, you know. All of you can't possibly be called Bunty. And then they confessed a little shyly that because I was a journalist and they didn't know where this was going, they decided that they had to come up with an alias. But only one of them came up with an alias in time, and that was Bunty. So, which is why, you know, one of them just adopted the Bunty thing. And from there, I met marigold farmers, this, that, and the other. And I realized at some point that the river was actually the first place where migrants might make a home. Because at that stage, you know, now the property sharks have got in, but at that stage, it was unclaimed territory. It, and it's beautiful. I think the first time that I actually got down there, I was shocked naively at how large the Yamuna was. I don't know whether any of you have ever tried to walk the banks of the Hooghly or whether that's even possible with construction out there. But a river surprises you, you know. And there were stretches of extraordinary beauty you know, early in the morning, uh, the unpolluted stretches are silvery gray, and you have egrets, you know, floating up into the sky, and one or the other of the bunty is preparing to go off and pickpocket somebody, you know, just to make a living. Uh, so, when you read this book, I'm not saying if you read this book, it is a when, um, you will discover many of these characters have found their way into, into the novel. Um, in very um, in very insidious ways often, often in the background. And it's really a novel that has such a diverse population 
of characters, which we will come to in a bit. But I just want to go back to how you've, how you've equated the river and the behavior of the river and the migrant population in Delhi. And I'd like to maybe ask you to read this portion about how you've talked about the tides of the river. Um, Thank you. Yeah. 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 So this is from a section where uh, three characters who turned out to be among my favorites in the novel. There's Chand, who's a farmer who meant to run away to the Himalayas. And he lives just on the outskirts of Delhi, but he hasn't really seen much of the world, you know? He runs as far as Delhi, and something about it catches its heart, as it did for many of us in my generation. And he bumps into Khalid and Rabia. And for a large part, this was true of Delhi in the 1980s and 90s to some extent. I don't think it mattered to them that they were from very different communities or religions, you know? A friendship born of necessity first, and then of uh, kind of little acts of mutual kindness and of enforced sharing starts to grow up. And this is the place where it happens. The Yamuna is the city's watery border, a river that carries a memory of clouds and ice down from the Himalayas, of glacier gray beauty and unpolluted waters, the color of storm clouds in a mountain sky, a dancing river before she reaches the plains. For the most part, Delhi turns its back on her, staining her swollen body with its ashes and garbage and sewage, choking her with the city's waste, its discards, its corpses and diseases. And most inhabitants notice the river goddess's turbulence only when she floods her banks, returning to the city all that it had discarded and dumped in her once clear waters. An invisible tide courses through the city, Chan knows. Every morning, the tide sends in a flood of people who work to build Delhi's roads and homes, to guard the factories and offices of the wealthy, sends in artisans and laborers, armies of domestic workers and clerks, mill workers and gardeners. And every evening, the tide ebbs, casting them back outside the city, strewn like human debris across the river banks, the floodplains, the unstable islands that appear in one season and vanish or broaden in time. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, really, especially coming out of recent history, um, how the migrants have suddenly literally walked into our consciousness in the last few years, um, meeting them again in this novel has really, uh, definitely for me, um, sort of reminded me about all these lives that we, even in this city, take for granted, uh, anywhere in, in the country take for granted, and how they really hold up a city to be what it is. And we don't um, sort of acknowledge that at all. And I just want to go a little further, and I want to read this one passage. It's a conversation between um, Chand and Rabia, sitting on the banks of the river in their little hut. And uh, Chan says, you can live in a city for decades without knowing if you belong to it. So what do you think you were breathing in all these years, asks Rabia. The air, the floating grime in the air, the rain, the monsoon breeze, the water, the earth, everyone's sweat, the farts from the buses, the pol politicians' nonsense speeches, the dust in summer, the mist off the river in winter. What is this belonging, not belonging? At some point, what you breathe in is what you become. That's no surprise. Um, so this, the book is really peppered with conversations like this. And um, I want you to talk a little bit now that we've seen a little bit of Chand and Rabia. Um, it's a book also that has, as I said, a sea of characters. And you enter the characters' lives at different points and go backwards and forwards in time. So it's a, it's a book also which is very difficult to pinpoint, oh, so-and-so is the protagonist, um, even though there is one sort of main story running through it. Um, so this bank of characters that you've created, if you could just talk to us a little bit about them. A lot of them were people, I mean, none of them are drawn from people I actually met. But I think I was lucky to be pulled out of the kind of... Uh, you know, very comfortable South Delhi, or I suppose here it would be South Calcutta life, I knew, uh, because of journalism. I was spending a lot of time as a reporter, a young reporter for the New York Times, uh, working the gender beat, and that took me around Delhi, around Uttar Pradesh, around parts of Haryana. And I think everywhere I met uh, 
In Delhi, there's an anxiety about belonging that's been there possibly for generations, but also it comes out of being part of a city that until the 1970s was tiny, you know. Calcutta has seen a lot of growth, a lot of changes in its fortunes and uh, ebbs and flows, but Delhi's just gone from being a tiny cluster of villages that went back at the same time, you know, more than 13 centuries in time, so there's that. It's been settled for a very long period. And uh, then it comes into this, bomb this future where it grows, you know, like almost a malignant cancer, if you want to see it that way or it grows uh, in a way that brings the India shining dream come true. And increasingly, I was drawn into conversations with people who felt in one way or the other that they had a stake in the city, however you know, difficult or challenging or itinerant their lives were. They could pass by a mall and say, I built that, you see? And uh, at the same time, if you were Muslim or if you were on the lower end of the migrant uh, totem pole, if you were a recent migrant, you would be tested by the city by being more or less, you know, forced to be itinerant around it for several years until finally maybe the city accepted you and gave you a place to belong. And when I wrote uh, Black River, this was 2017 was when I really started. And at the time I was feeling, it hadn't really started up, but I was feeling three griefs and one great happiness, you know. And I think the three griefs came from uh, feeling that the city, the air of it was being poisoned, more or less. And the beginnings of that are something that I start to feel in Calcutta, or feel on sense, you know, uh, that something's wrong. The air, the earth, uh, those things are not necessarily that far away from who we are. They are very much part of us. We don't live outside of our environments. And the second part of the poisoning then was very early, but it was uh, started by politics, but it was a change in people's minds and hearts. You know, suddenly there was, there was no space. And suddenly in a city that had learned, unlike villages, to desegregate by force, if not by choice, was putting a lot of walls back up. And that was the second grief. And the third grief was just coming out of the job itself. Uh, I had a map that I made uh, at one point of, of women who were missing, of women and girls who were missing, and whose rapes or murders or disappearances were too minor, really, to catch the attention of the press, you know? And uh, it, it, these were moments you don't forget. You go into a village because you've been called there by someone, and they say, Madam Ji, you've arrived at the right time. We've got something for your newspaper. And that something is the bodies of three young girls being pulled out of the, the pond. And the family is sitting there looking at you with a kind of hope, you know, that maybe if you or somebody writes about this, maybe we have one shot at justice. And after a while, you know, those bodies, that missing, that, that the absence of not just, it wasn't just murders, you know, what you miss is the lives that those women, those girls never got to lead you know, which is in part what the book starts with. Okay. Those were three griefs. And running alongside them, though, was this ineradicable current of tenderness and friendship. And that was coming from the people, and it was mute. You know, it's not the kind of resistance you see in a protest when people gather on the street saying, we will have nothing to do with this hateful talk or with this hateful politics. It was just a, yes, yes, you want to separate us, but that is my friend from the other community. And he has been my friend for 70 years, and he will keep being my friend, and I will nod my head when you say what you do. You see what I mean? There was a persistence, and I don't want to, uh, you know, romanticize, say that the poor are kind or whatever, because if you're poor, you're perfectly capable of being terrible to your daughter-in-law. You're perfectly capable of being really horrible or mean to your neighbor. But there was a great deal of kindness. There was a great deal of generosity in that way of living. And I guess it all started to come together in the space of this book, you know? Um, you've talked about justice, and I want to push you a little bit on that, because the kind of um, justice that you find in this book, you find it's, it's problematized as to what is justice, um, and the, the various colors of justice, and the various ways, the arms of justice that we 
are taught to believe are all um, moving in the same direction, how they actually behave. And um, what, what I found, again, as a reader, is um, there isn't a critique of this should happen, or that should happen, or this is good, or this is bad. There's actually a great deal of compassion for these pe all the people who are caught, um, who, are, who make up this, this system, and, and, and um, the different ways that people are searching for and defining justice. Um, there's a great deal of compassion in it. So if, um, and of course, because the book is also one of the ways it's described, it's, it's a police procedural kind of thing. So if you can talk a little bit about that again, probably coming from your journalist experience as well. I think the pleasure of writing something that uh, is a bit of a khichuri, you know, uh, is that it's either crime fiction or noir fiction or police procedure, and it doesn't matter what label you stick on it, it can, it can comfortably take in all of those. I think maybe that's one of the reasons why so many people are turning to writing crime these days, you know. Uh, you have Tanut Solanki, you've got uh, Anita's uh, Inspector Go uh, Gauda mysteries, and I think it's in part because all of us are asking ourselves that question, what does justice look like, you know? in a system where you might end up uh, going to court for years and years, where the most egregious crimes can happen, and because the perpetrator is protected by powerful uh, political parties, they will never be brought to justice. In the middle of that, there are small figures, you know, someone like Ombi, the policeman uh, who features in the book. He's not a man who's a crusader, and I met a lot of people like him. They weren't necessarily you know, out there to do good in this world. But they could not help in a thoroughly corrupt you know, society and a thoroughly corrupt police force that was a reflection of that society. They could somehow not help wanting justice. And the other part of it is what happens increasingly across the North, and I believe in Bengal as well. People take the law into their own hands. And for me, it was very difficult to say one of my favorite characters is uh, a man who has suffered, you know, who is taken on a great loss, a great set of griefs. And then what do you say? The village wants the justice of the mob. They don't care about you know, your procedures and uh, how long it's going to take before the course, uh, case finally trundles through the courts. The, once the TV cameras go, justice is over and done with. You know, they don't care about guilt or innocence. And he's willing to commit a second murder or a third murder, maybe, you know, in order to find some kind of closure. I think for a lot of people whom I met uh, in the course of this, particularly the families, I think the hardest hit were actually the families who had lost a girl and who had others to take care of, because then they had to balance their need for justice against uh, what the community wanted, which was often hurry up and just get a verdict out that's in our way, you know, some form of closure. But what actually brings peace, and that's a question that runs through the book in this time, in particularly, where do you look for justice when the courts aren't with you, when the police aren't with you, when nobody is a, the most powerful are allowed to bend this to you? Then is it all right to take it into your hands? And I don't have an easy yes or no. And that's exactly what I, you know, what I found in the book, that what I'm calling the compassion that is there for all the people who are in the book. Um, and uh, it's not, they're not painted in, oh, you are on the good side or you are on the bad side, but there's this... Uh, as a reader, you're really um, thinking about what would I do in that position, and what choices would I have made in that position, which is, which then makes you a stakeholder in in what is going on, and that I think that is um, very powerful in the novel. And going back to a word you used, um, along with justice, uh, you, you were talking about tenderness, uh, and you were talking about um, uh, two of the main characters in the book. Uh, and um, I would like you to read maybe this section about um, when he holds his daughter for the first oh, time. I love that section. And uh, this is, uh, I don't think there's any spoilers in saying that um, the man who in this section has, has suffered the loss of the thing that he loves most. And this is from a section where after a very difficult birth, where he also loses somebody he holds dear, he finally holds his daughter in his hands. Once he had almost stepped on a day's bat, 
fallen to the ground in some nocturnal mishap. He had bent and picked it up, wanting to be gentle, and felt the creature curl and shiver in his careful hands. He remembers that weed, the delicacy of it, the trembling bones, when he holds his daughter for the first time, taking her from Rabia. She weighs less than a paper bag of flour, less than a pillow stuffed with black mustard seeds. She smells like the warm spring grass when he takes an axe to it, like the first rains of summer falling on the hot earth, the scent of her neck like jaggery stirred over an open fire. She smells of her mother's blood and of her own sweetness. If he strokes her forehead lightly, letting his fingers touch her miraculous skin, still sprinkled with the white down of birth, she curls her feet inwards and goes to sleep in his arms. Through the numbness of his sudden loss, these things of sustenance. So, um, thank you so much for, not just for reading it, but that is really such a beautiful passage uh, in, in a novel which is not always, um, which has many rough edges, which has a lot of uh, violence, which has, um, it is Delhi. <laughs> so, and it is Delhi and the bad lands of Delhi, if I might call it that as well. So, um, Delhi has good lands. Delhi has good lands, I know. But we, <laughs> no, we, no, I'm asking. Oh, well, um, we, we will leave that as a question and not enter into that debate whether Delhi has good lands or not. Um, but really, uh, to, to look at that word sustenance a little bit because, um, and to connect it back to what you were saying about, um, say, in the 80s and 90s, and even when I was in Delhi in the early 90s, uh, the city having space for people and giving sustenance to people and allowing that, um, allowing people to find a fissure or a, some gap within which to exist and not bother anybody else. And how that has really changed, that sort of homogenization of the city that has happened, where those fissures are being systematically erased in various ways. I think that's sort of a hidden thread that runs through the book. So if, if you could talk a little bit about that and um, the connecting to this, this thing of the city and sustenance and its people. It's strange to think of Delhi as a nourishing place, you know, the capital of this country. But it has been. There's a reason why migrants have come there for generations. And uh, all of that is being bulldozed now, you know. And I use that, I think, because that bulldozer has become more or less one of the symbols of our ages. And when I see that machine knocking down people's homes or, you know, people's livelihoods, basically because they are Muslims, they are the wrong religion, you know why that is being done. And you know that there is an anger behind the bulldozing that comes from really people living together in peace, side by side, with different practices, different cultures, different traditions, is seen as a threat, you see? And uh, in that case, you must introduce segregation and you must flatten what has come before. You know, and I, I know this sounds like a rant, but this book is set in 2017 when all of that was just about nibbling at the edges and um, starting to take a bite out of people. One of the gentlest characters in the book is a quiet man, you know, who loves the river and who loves animals and birds and uh, being left on his own. And after one time too many in the hands of the police, um, he loses his very fragile grasp on reality little by little. You know, the world is so harsh that then you want to escape into another place. Another man who's racked by demons turns himself into a kind of avenger, you know, around the ponds and the lakes of the Yamuna. But I think, you know, it's instinctive in whatever goodness there is in the book, and there's a fair amount, surprisingly, for a book that's steeped in blood and that um, actually starts with not one but two murders, you know. Uh, one always catches the public eye because that's the murder of an innocent, and the other is the murder of somebody who's complicit in a set of equally terrible crimes, you know, one crime leads to another. But somewhere in the middle of that, you know, the possibilities of life in a big city is just that you can reach across everything that divides you, that you might find friendship in somebody whom you may never have met back at home. 
And it's so funny to think that these little things, you know, friendship, community, falling in love, all of these are the things that seem to be so threatening to an entire political order. And not just so threatening, but those are the things that uh, people are now scared to do, perhaps because there is there is the threat of what may happen uh, and uh, and because the walls have come up exactly in those almost natural um, ways of being and existing uh, and interacting with each other um, so yes yes we will go to the audience um, i just wanted to um, flag one other thing before we read the biryani passage um, the fact that we've already discussed that it's a novel which is has a crime story running through it but really again coming back to me as a reader what what stays with me very much is that you've placed so many of these things that we've been talking about not set front and center but sort of in our peripheral vision or just outside our peripheral vision but we always know that they are there and you're always aware of this changing city and scenario and um, i think that is what really lifts um, lifts the book into it's not just a well written crime story it's w without dissing the genre at all I love crime, crime fiction but it's, it becomes so much about what has happened in Delhi what as you said is beginning to happen in our city and what sadly is happening across the country um, but to go back to one of our lighter passages will you read the biryani passage and then we will open and, it thank you so much for <laughs> You know, everything that you've brought to the conversation, Vikram. Oh, very welcome. Welcome. It's all come from the book, not from me. <laughs> so this came from a moment of uh, tremendous celebration. There's a marriage happening in a neighborhood, and people are getting together, and they're doing what people do, which is actually what Delhi was to me years back in my 20s. We used to hang out at each other's bursatis, and then... Uh, pretty much, you know, cook for each other, writers, artists, friends, activists, all of that. So, and what's on the menu is uh, biryani, being cooked by Chand and Badsha Mia. So, he says um, to Rabia, you don't drown a biryani in an ocean of rough, harsh spices, but the secret of a good biryani is what? You tell me. Rabia considered the meat, already marinated for several hours, and the rice set out to cook in salted water in a massive brass steak, the glass dishes that held food coloring and the fragrant water. Bacha Mia had extracted that from jasmine flowers. She thinks about it. The art is in mixing it, right? He laughed, pleased. Yes, he said, introducing the meat and the rice and the potatoes to one another in the right order at the right time. They must stay distinct but come together in such harmony that they create something new. That and timing and learning not to disturb the different layers. The art of making a biryani doesn't end with cooking it. The true pleasure and the measure of your skill will become apparent when you serve it. You must lift it out just so, mingling the elements but not messing it up. It's a biryani, not a khichri. <laughs> so, on that happy culinary note, uh, any questions? Please keep the questions as questions and not as comments. Niranjana is here. We can share comments later. We have time for about two, maybe three questions if they're really short. Uh, one, uh, my question is, uh, since... It's on. We can hear you. Yeah. Uh, you talked about the 80s and 90s Delhi uh, and your novel. Uh, the time frame is 2017. Mm -hmm. And 17 to till date, uh, the, I may say the demographics is changing even further. Uh, Yamuna Bank, so either uh, what is now not just Delhi, NCR, the Noidas and Gurgaon, and uh, where the demographics are changing, how have you tried to capture that uh, since 2017, uh, or have you attempted to capture that change in demographics here? And two, uh, just a question, is it going to uh, create a serial character with Delhi as the uh, venue for the plot in future uh, are we looking at a series uh, sort of thing with one serial character uh, i don't think i consciously set out to map the demographics but that happened organically because of who the characters were you know because chand 
Khalid and uh, Rabia were both outsiders and insiders. And there's three sections. There's uh, Bright Dairy, which is set next to one of the city's biggest landfills. And uh, it's a garbage mountain that is currently, you know, almost rivaling the Ravali ranges. Very toxic, very polluted. But when you hang out there, you realize that people have incorporated into, into part of their imaginations. The kids play on the slopes, I don't know how, but they do, you know. And they make up stories about, uh, Achha, today the mountain is rumbling because the jinn under the mountain must be angry and all of that. And one part of it is with the Aravadis, which is, I think, the new frontier. You know, Delhi is on the strip of constant expansion. And it's a city I, I curse, I'm constantly at war with. I think it's trying to kill me for sure, you know, choking uh, my breath off one bit after another. But it's also the city that I love with all my heart. I, it made me a writer. It uh, nourishes people in a strange way, or used to. You know, it used to leave them alone. And uh, perhaps, is it going to be a series? I don't know about that, but there is a next book. And it does feature one of the characters from Black River. And it moves the time frame to about 2019-20. So that should be fun. Any uh, more questions? There's one. Oh, sorry. Yes. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you were talking about this close friendship which started the 70-year-old friendship. Do you notice a change in the younger generation? That Are these friendships continuing? They're continuing, but they're being disrupted. So an axiom uh, that, again, you know, you learn easily on the job, the moment the cops leap up and down or uh, say that something is wrong, you know that that thing is happening. You know, if a cop panchayat says women shouldn't be wearing jeans or they are using mobile phones too much or they're falling in love with the wrong sort of boys, then you know that that's actually happening, which is uh, curiously reassuring. Yeah. <laughs> In the next generation, I think uh, those friendships tend to start to happen organically, but I will say that that possibility is being disrupted. And it really depends on what you teach uh, children in school. Our generation perhaps was lucky to grow up with, you know, cartoon ideas maybe of unity and diversity, but that's what we imbibed. If you start to teach children right from the start, you shouldn't play with that person. He's dirty, his family is dirty then they won't. But it's a funny thing, you know, how curiosity works. Uh, I also spend a fair amount of time in places like the malls in Ghaziabad, the satellite cities, Faridabad, and in the gyms, you know, in Faridabad, which are not the posh gyms of South Delhi. That's where those friendships happen across caste, hugely, and across religion, hugely. It's, it's become a strange space, you know, like a kind of modern Akhara but without the politics of the Akhara, where you can meet, and you'd be surprised how much falling in love there is along same-sex lines as well. So it's almost like every taboo is being broken, but in these very strange, you know, little uh, pockets, and they're never allowed to quite burst into the light. I, I hope that helps to some extent. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time, but let's hope that these little pockets uh, just keep building when the big pockets are being problematized. Thank you so much and thank you Nilanjana for and this Thanks Vikram session. and I just wanted to say you know big hand of applause for the ladies who've been the people who've been running around with the mics they've been doing it all through the festival the runners and I, I really love the job they do. Thanks. Thank you.